There's two stumbling blocks. I believe it's the food and, and then I believe it's the support and having uh, your family members, having some kind of a support network. When people try to do this and they fall off the wagon, they just give up. It's usually because they don't have a spouse or a family member who's doing it with them. So doing it with somebody is, I think, pretty important. This is the Healthy Lifestyle Solutions Podcast, and I'm your host, Maya Acosta. If you're willing to go with me, together we can discover how simple lifestyle choices can help improve our quality of life. Let's get started. And today I have Kim Campbell. Welcome, Kim. Hi, Maya. Nice to be here. Many people hear me on the podcast talk about Plan Peer communities and the film Plan Peer Nation. And whenever people reach out to us and they're asking for support, I always say, go look for the pot network because you might be able to find people in your area who can offer support. Mm -hmm. um, so we're going to talk about everything that you're doing. You're going to give us a little bit of insight to maybe like a part two documentary that will kind of complement the first film. Plan Pure Nation. And mm -hmm. we're going to talk about you, your work as a chef and your cookbooks. And so there's just so much to explore. And I'm excited that you're here. But again, thank you for being with us. You're married to Nelson Campbell. Nelson's father and his brother co-wrote The China Study, which is a heavily science-based, research-based book that mm -hmm we actually ask a lot of people to read if they enjoy reading science. Um, so feel free to talk about any of those things. But we've, you know, we, we enjoy the, the Campbell family. We enjoy everything that you've done. Um, we take pride in knowing about Plant Pure Nation, the film, the, the pod network, all that you're building. And one of the things that you might touch on today is some of the products that you're probably coming out with as well. So do you want to talk a little bit about the China study? I will. When I first met Colin, which was back in the 80s, because Nelson and I go way back to 1980, early 80s, 81. And Colin was doing his research in China. So he was traveling and he'd be gone for two to three, four weeks at a time. And then he would come back. He was always excited, always sharing his research, the data and things that he was learning. So I was still in high school when that happened because we met when we were young. And I was really excited about what what was transpiring. So I went to college and majored in nutrition. And that wasn't the same nutrition that Colin was talking about. It was very, very different. So I ended up going into teaching and took a little different path. Um, but then he wrote the China study. And I, I, I would say to people who love the science and who have to be convinced because of the science, I know we talked about this earlier, because your husband is a physician. And a lot of physicians and a lot of people need, need the science and the data. That book is, a, it's very heavily um, science-based, but it's also easy to read. I found it very interesting and the pages were just turning and whipping and I was learning so much. So I, I urge people, I know the book feels thick. There's a lot of information, but, you know, take it in small bites, watch Forks Over Knives, um, read the China study, and then kind of go from there. Because to me, that is the foundation of understanding why we should be eating a whole food plant-based diet. Yeah. You said it so beautifully. Absolutely. And I didn't realize that you were so young at the time that all this research was happening. Mm -hmm. I can't even imagine what it's been like for you to have seen what's developed over the 20, 30 years or so of um, mm -hmm. all this work, to have mm -hmm. seen the movement grow to to see so many people jump on board, not only health professionals, but now you have pod leaders and you have people just leading and teaching in their own communities because they understand what you just said, the power um, behind going plant based. So it just it must be amazing for you to be part of all of this. It, it really is, Maya, because when when we were first learning about all of this, we were having our family. We were very very young in our twenties and not doing everything perfect. But thinking we were, you know, it was a different world. There weren't the cookbooks and there weren't the, the food products that are out there now and the knowledge. But I would say in the last probably 15 years, I feel like it's really kind of blown up. And I feel like there's a lot of physicians. You can go to almost any city now and find physicians who support a plant-based diet, who know about the research. And that wasn't true 20, 30 years ago. I feel like if, if you go to the grocery store, you can find all kinds of plant-based milks and I guess 
plant-based products if you want to dive into some of the processed foods, but but it's there if you want to transition to it. So it, it is a very different world. And I we saw that change after Plant Pure Nation too. And I, I just I think people are they're getting more educated. The internet came out and people are watching YouTubes and it's it's really exciting. It's been exciting for me to watch the transformation. People come to, as we know, this way of living various ways. Um, some people just get it very early on how animal-based foods can harm the environment. Uh, some people just care about the animals and they, and they make a choice. They don't need all the research. But I think it's also important to continue to highlight those pioneers. Mm -hmm. And Dr. T. Colin Campbell was one of the speakers at the recent uh, Lysol Medicine Conference that I attended in Orlando. Mm -hmm. And it's always just so wonderful to continue to hear him emphasize that out of all the things, because I do talk about lifestyle medicine a lot here on the podcast, out of all the pillars, food is the most important. Mm -hmm. um, and what you're doing, I want to acknowledge your work as well with your, your cookbooks and all that you have done. You have really offered a lot of support. And I was watching you during the pandemic when you started going live with your cooking shows. Uh, and um, Nelson was supporting you as well with all the technical stuff. So tell us a little bit about that. And you did say that you might consider resuming your live cooking shows. We did these shows during the pandemic. Um, early on, you know, people weren't leaving their homes. And we decided well, this is a great time to do cook-alongs. I wanted to, people to come on live with me and cook and you know, make mistakes and develop new recipes. And it, it was just really fun. And we started out with small groups and it kept growing and growing. So we did these live shows for 50, almost a year. It was just, just shy of a year. I think we have over 50 shows. Um, and we, the same people would come in. I would send grocery lists and I would send the, the recipe and all the appliances that they needed. And many people said, you need to write another cookbook. So that's where that came from. I wrote um, this. This is my third cookbook. It's called Plant Pure Comfort Food. And a lot of the recipes that are in here are the recipes that we used when we were doing our, I call it my pandemic cook along. I had testers. I had built in testers. So I didn't have to send recipes out to people. People were emailing me and they were saying, oh, I, you know, I don't know if I like this one, but I love this one. So I used a lot of their information to create the cookbook. I got about a year into the pandemic and I contacted Ben Bella, who was our publishing company. They also published the China study as well. And all they do a lot of plant-based cookbooks. So I told them, I think I have a cookbook. And they were excited. Uh, we hired a photographer and it took a while to, to get it done because of the, the pandemic. Every, everything took a little bit longer. So I've spent the last year working with them to publish this cookbook and it's been done for a while, but because of paper and things like that, it's taken a little longer to get on the on the Amazon shelves. And I don't know when this podcast will come out, but it's December 14th. So I, you know, that that's where that that's where the cookbooks come from. And my background in culinary goes way back to when I was a little kid. I've been doing this for a long time. And when I was in college, I always thought I should have gone to culinary school. So we went full circle. I I went I raised three kids and we raised three kids and then taught school for several years. And then I left my teaching job to work with Nelson. And so I feel like I've gone full circle. You know, I started out in dietetics and ended up in teaching and then ended up back in culinary. And now I'm doing culinary education and cookbooks. So it's been a fun ride. I absolutely love what I do. And I could sit here and talk to you about it forever because I'm just really passionate about it. And I'm, I feel really honored that I have had the ability to write these books and help educate people to better health. We, we don't use any oil and all of my recipes are whole food plant based. I do use um, small amounts of sugar and salt. So I'm not SOS for you. I, we, yeah. we talked to Colin about this quite a bit about, you know, not using any salts in our recipe or any sugars in our recipes. There isn't really a lot of research out there that supports necessarily being an SOS free um, diet. However, if you want to tr do that and people enjoy it, I, obviously there's no risks involved with it, but I think using minimal amounts of salts and sugars. And, and I say that carefully because if you're using a lot of processed foods, right there, you're getting a lot of salts. 
So, but if you're cooking your own food and preparing your own food, you can control the salt and you can put it in last, you know, you can, it's, it's really, really interesting when you look at the sodium levels in a pretzel bag that's vegan, by the way. And then you look at the sodium in a recipe when you can put a quarter of a teaspoon, half a teaspoon, whatever you want to put in it. So I, I really think it's important to um, feed people food that has flavor that will draw them in uh, and then they can pull back the salt from there if they want to. So, mm -hmm. yeah. I agree with you. I think, and I've learned this, right? Like as we educate ourselves about this way of living, I learned that the majority of our sodium comes from processed foods, as you mm -hmm. said. So I too don't shy away from um, telling people that haven't made a full transition. I don't shy away from that. I just tell them like you do to add your salt at the end of uh, your cooking, uh, mm -hmm. the cooking process, and then um, it's easier to now pay attention to the sodium levels, even in like the jarred, um, already prepared marinara sauce and in your beans. And it's amazing, Kim, because now I'm highly, highly sensitive to salty foods. Where you taste, it's the same with sugar. I feel the same way with sugar. I, I, I've never had a sweet tooth. So when I eat a full blown vegan cookie, it really hits me in the head. And I think Phew, my stomach, I'm not used to eating that much sugar. So yeah, the more you get away from that, the more you're going to really notice it and the less you'll need. I live close to one of the few Barnes and Nobles that are left in the country, right? So I love going over there and I'm always checking out the cookbooks. That's my passion. And I've seen your books. They're so beautiful. So this one, the Plan Pure Comfort Food uh, is your latest. How is that different from your first two cookbooks? And um, is there a common theme when it comes to the recipes? Um, I think so. This cookbook, I like cuisine from a lot of different cultures. So Nelson and I love, we like Indian food and Mexican food and Irish food and Middle East. I mean, all over the world. So I tried to pick food from different cultures that wasn't necessarily plant-based. How can I make it plant-based? Those traditional foods like falafels, which is a street food, right? Um, uh, Asian dumplings and Irish cold cannon soup, really traditional foods, but making them healthier without the added oils and the cheeses and the meats. So that's where we came up with the name comfort food. I would have preferred something to describe that it was basically from all different cultures. So titles, I mean, <laughs> titles are hard to come by, but that's how this book is a little bit different. There's a lot of unique dishes in here that, that we would recognize and see in a lot of restaurants. I think all three of my books really dive into comfort food. And I think it has to do with our philosophy about food. Nelson and I believe that if we don't meet people where they're at and learn how to make plant-based foods that are traditional and, you know, lasagna and pizza and all those things that American people love and people all over the world, then we're not going to, we're not going to bring them in. Cause I think that's the biggest stumbling block to success. There's two stumbling blocks. I believe it's the food. And, and then I believe it's the support and having uh, your family members, having some kind of a support network. When people try to do this and they fall off the wagon and they just give up, it's usually because they don't have a spouse or a family member who's doing it with them. So doing it with somebody is, I think, pretty important. Mm -hmm. So um, my philosophy is to just kind of bathe people in their traditional foods. And that's how I got my parents were kind of interested in doing this. And I have other family members. And that's how I convinced them a little bit. I, they're still not there yet. Yeah. That's why I'm hesitating. But <laughs> You know, I'm glad that you touch on that because a lot of us are in those shoes and you would think uh, you've been on this path much longer than I have because you learned about the science early on and I haven't. I've, uh, I've been on this path going on almost seven years and, I, you know, people ask us all the time, "Is are your family members plant-based? And we say no, <laughs> just not everybody will be open. But I, I, I love it when the family does go out of their way to make sure that they cook plant-based or that they're open to that. And I have a niece who made a delicious lasagna recently with vegetables and she's not fully plant-based, but because she knew my husband and I were visiting, she cooked what she's now eating more regularly. My yeah. sister said, you should see the large salads that she eats. And it's all, you know, being an example, no judgment. 
Um, you touch on two great things. Food, first is the taste in food. Just everybody wants to continue to eat, to eat delicious food. And then you touched on support. So I want to validate that I understand why people don't make that change. Um, my mom asked me recently, don't you ever get tired of cooking? And I said, yes, I do. But I'm never going to stop because I know that this is the best way for me to live. I mean, yeah. I would be a liar to say that I don't get tired. Um, but you learn how to batch cook and prep and think ahead of time. So where do you find your testers? And do you always have them for every cookbook? I, you know what, I know a lot of cookbook authors, um, plant-based cookbook authors that do have, a, they have a group of, they have literally Facebook groups where they throw recipes out there and they have a group test it. I didn't do that. I used my family. Uh, we have some great cooks in the Campbell family because we're all plant-based. Yes. I have several sister-in-laws and a sister-in-law who wrote a cookbook. She wrote the China Study cookbook. So I, I kind of throw recipes at them. And my child, my own children, uh, they're all plant based and they're adults now in their 20s and 30s. Um, and they they love to try the recipes. So I, I feel like between that and then Nelson is become a very good <laughs> taste tester. And he's he's become pretty good at cooking, too. So I rely on him a lot. Um, I should I should go into the testing one of the things that we are testing right now is we are developing, we have developed fro a frozen line, which is in, available at Publix and Lowe's. Um, we have burritos. Um, there's a bunch of stores that I'm probably not saying all of them because it, that we, Wegmans, for example, is interested. There's several that are interested. Not all of them are on board, but they're mostly East Coast supermarkets. So I developed all, all of those recipes. So as far as testers, we, we use people at Plant Pure to test those. Um, we've also developed a dry line, and we don't have a, an official name for them. Um, they're kind of like a hamburger helper, so we're thinking of calling them healthy helpers. So they're, they're sauce-based. Uh, there's five different sauces. There's a cheese sauce and an enchilada sauce, and there's a peanut sauce and a curry sauce, and there's one more that I'm forgetting, and there's a veggie burger. So basically, these sauces, you can build recipes with them. So we're going to create an ebook or online resource where people can buy these packs and they can go in and they can build recipes. They can make things like taco soup or uh, scalloped potatoes, or a lot of the recipes in my cookbook, um, we're, we're grabbing from those too. So, because I think a lot of people, they don't want to just open up frozen food. It's expensive. It's not very filling. Um, it's just, you know, it's, it's not very environmentally friendly, I guess at times, but if you could have a, a dry line and create a sauce and build from there, I think people get the feeling that they're cooking too. And they have a little bit of ownership in their food without having to do all the work. So anyways, when, when I talk about testers, I think about our products, too, because we've had to have, to have testers for that as well. I'm excited about the sauces because that's exactly what we need when we fir first make that transition, like mm -hmm. the tomato sauce or a cheesy sauce so that we can replace a standard, say, macaroni and cheese or nacho cheese or whatever it may be, because I'm not too familiar with um, your sauces right now. But mm -hmm. that in itself saves so much time like if we can just have it already made and then just add it on top of our pot potatoes or our veggies or if we want to do a pasta so um that's very exciting let's talk about um there's so much you just touched on in terms of plan pure i did say that um nelson was part of our recent summit that we had for pod leaders and he teased us a little bit about the documentary that will complement Plan Pure Nation, which is what got us very excited about being part of this organization. What can you tell us? Oh, I, I'd love to talk about what, what we did in Greensboro. So Plan Pure Nation, we go back to the first documentary that Nelson did. Plan Pure Net Nation really gets into, you know, the, the basic of, of why we, you know, the benefits of being plant-based, but why do we not know this information? And he tried to pass legislation. He talked to physicians and you really get the you get the story about why you're not hearing this, because if it's true, if the China study is true and all this research is out there, why aren't doctors talking about it? Why? Why is our government not really preaching this to people? So that movie addresses that question. This movie is very interesting. We did an immersion in Greensboro during the pandemic, towards the end of the pandemic. Well, I guess it was in the middle. We brought six diabetics on board and some of them brought their spouses. 
And we hired another chef, Fernando Peralta from Pennsylvania. And he and I did all the cooking. We cooked breakfast, lunch, and dinner for these folks. And Lori Marvis, our physician, in-house physician, came down, spent the 10 days with us. She put continuous glucose monitors on people and um, got them off their meds. Uh, it's an amazing story. I, I won't tell you how fast or what, you know, what, what transpired during that. I probably, I probably already gave away too much. I get so excited about this immersion. Um, it just really for, for us, I mean, we, we know that this is healing, especially for people who are diabetic, but to actually see it and live with these people and experience it, um, was, was pretty amazing. And even just watching their change in personality as they got off of their medications that, you know, they, they were more relaxed, they were sleeping better, they were exercising and doing all of that. Um, so, so then, you know, Nelson talks about the pandemic and, you know, why we haven't heard more about this information. And I'll stop there because I'm just going to tell you everything, Maya. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll stop. I want to yeah. sort of comment on how you cover the first film, because I want to at least get an idea of what you hope to accomplish with the second film. What the first film did for me when I watched it, and it was early in my understanding this way of living, is that after I watched it, having been a former elementary school teacher mm -hmm. at a public school, right? So we understand <clears throat> big food. After I watched the film, Plant Pure Nation, I understood the politics of food and policy. And it broke my heart. Um, although I had the training through eCornell, you know, plant-based nutrition, I got it, but it, it, in a documentary, it's so much more powerful. And, I, and it broke my heart because I remember as a school teacher, I would see the awful food that our students were fed because the children that can't afford quality food at home are subjected to this way of eating in, at the, in the public school systems. Um, so at the end of the film, Nelson proves how difficult it is, the monster that we're facing, that's how I describe it, of creating change. And he speaks to us at what I felt was a heart to heart level. And he says, the way the change is going to happen won't be from the top down, it has to start at a grassroots level to create change, meaning we have to be the ones that that call for the change and start supporting our own communities. And after I watched the film, which I feel like I watch twice every year, um, um, that's when we said we want to we want to be leaders and we mm -hmm. and and we want to help support people and it's never a, even right now when i'm speaking i i get chills it it moved me so much kim mm -hmm. it moved me so much that i believe so much in what plan pure is doing mm -hmm. um and with the communities and the education and the cookbooks and all that you all have done has been con has continued to inspire me but now that i know that there's another film what do you, since I know you don't want to give away too much, what do we hope to accomplish with the second film? You touched on it really well. You talked about the fact that, you know, we, we need to come at this from a grassroots level and we need to, you know, come together and kind of make those demands from the higher, you know, from the people in the higher up positions. Um, mm -hmm. And this film touches on it too, because, you know, we, we all went through a, a pretty rough pandemic and during the pandemic, you know, we, we knew, we learned, we didn't know early on, but we learned as the pandemic went on that people who were dying of COVID were people who suffered from, from preconditions, diabetes, heart disease, obesity. Um, these were some of the conditions. These were the people that were dying of COVID. We discovered that nobody was really talking about nutrition during this time period. And I remember thinking it myself, you know, there were lots of things that were talked about but nobody was really talking. And, and again, it, that, that's been something, that's a thread that's run through for, for years and years. I mean, Colin's been fighting this battle ever since I've known him. So again, here we have a pandemic. And the first thing that I thought within the first six months of, the, of COVID was, well, if this doesn't do it, I don't know what will. I mean, aren't we, aren't we going to talk about health and nutrition and being in a position of um, immunity? and preventing the worst possible outcomes of COVID or any virus for that matter. So um, I, that, that was disappointing for me. And here we are two years out from when the pandemic started and they're still not talking about it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh. so. It became very um, controversial and political to yeah. 
I don't even want to say the word, but um, I will say that I, I feel like when we're going through something like this, you would think that we would be talking about pre-existing conditions and what's causing people to have these. Why do we have so much obesity and so much diabetes, lifestyle diseases? I think a lot of us came like in the community had hoped that this would wake up our society to the fact that we have control over our health. We have the power to improve our health. Mm -hmm. So, so our, so. our daughter is a, a nurse and she was working at bedside care during um, COVID. And so she got a front row seat to all of this was working with COVID patients as well. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. one of the things that she said is that the, the food that they're feeding these patients is beyond toxic. Um, and just like you were talking about children in school systems. I mean, I, I've, I've been in schools mm -hmm. for a long time and I know what they're feeding kids. But when you think of a hospital, my mother's in the hospital right now having surgery. When you think about what they're going to feed her when she comes out of surgery, I mean, the, la the last time she was in the hospital, they gave her pizza and macaroni and cheese, and then they gave her oh. juice. That was her meal. Oh my goodness. My father wouldn't, you know, he had prostate or he had colon cancer, he had prostate cancer and colon cancer. And when he was hospitalized, one of the first foods they started to feed him after surgery was egg whites, egg whites, mm -hmm. and then it was yogurt. And so I, you know, I just don't understand it. I, I, I think we know, I think we know better than, than that. I mean, okay, so let's say you're not plant-based. You still would be feeding your patients plenty of fiber and fruits and vegetables, but they're not even doing that. So I, I, I get really uh, passionate and disgusted when I hear those kinds of stories. And, you know, you have a, a mother who, you know, is struggling with health issues. So when they're being hospitalized and they're being told by the, their physicians and their caretakers that, they don't need to eat plant-based. It's so frustrating. Yes, it is. The second point that you had made was on support. And I just lightly want to touch on the pod network that mm -hmm. um, Plan Peer developed. And um, you might have heard, because I know you're a pod leader as well, that, you know, our momentum kind of stall like it just came to a halt uh, oh, yeah. the momentum that we all had in working in supporting our communities and many of us are volunteers like we we do this free of charge you know in other words we help educate people in our areas i don't know if you'd like to share anything about your experience as a pod leader the changes you've seen within pods or anything like that mm -hmm. um so we have we had a pod here in mabin north carolina and we um, consolidated with another pod in Chapel Hill because we have pod leaders there. So the three of us kind of worked together because we felt like we were having two meetings a month and the same people were coming. So I said, well, let's just have yeah. one pod. So we kind of came together, which has been really nice. Initially, I will say our pod was small. Uh, you know, it was, a, it was a few a few people and then it kind of it grew and it grew and people started coming from you know, they would drive an hour to come to a pod meeting. We did, we had, we had different topics that we touched on. We showed films, um, we did Q and A's. We actually brought Colin into a pod meeting. Well, that, that made our pod meeting grow. <laughs> we had a lot of people for that <laughs> pod meeting. Um, but, but we've had gardeners come um, and talk to the group about that. I took them one time on a grocery store tour. That was a lot of fun. We clogged up the aisles nicely. I think there's a lot of things that you have to find out what your pod is interested in. What are their interests? And find out from plant care communities what the resources are because there's there's many resources. You can do restaurant campaign. I know that we did that here in Durham and Chapel Hill. Um, square foot gardening. Um, I don't know. You, you probably can answer that question better than I can, Maya. <laughs> yeah, well, I... I like what you just pointed out is that every group can be different depending mm -hmm. on the level of education in terms of knowledge, the knowledge they already have about uh, living a plant-based lifestyle uh, and the resources in the community. I've never done a, a grocery store tour. I'm very curious about it. I just I've never known if I like need permission from a manager to take a small group and show them how yeah. to do groceries. So there are some things I haven't done, but I've done the film screenings, which are very powerful. Mm -hmm. I've done panel discussions and potlucks 
and testimonials are powerful. I'm resuming and the momentum will start to pick up, but it's been slow. We didn't have the momentum either. We were doing a lot of uh, pod meetings outside, sort of picnic areas, and we had the same people would come. And I think a lot of people were a little bit nervous initially. And then we, the last two meetings have been indoors and we've had them. There's a facility in Chapel Hill where we have them and we have had such a good turnout. I think people are excited to get back out and to connect with other people. We have a, we have a meeting tomorrow. So uh, and we usually do what you do. We have a potluck, which is like eating a, a huge Thanksgiving spread every time we have a meeting. We ask anybody <laughs> if they have any stories they'd like to share. And it seems like in very, we always get somebody that wants to share their plant-based journey or something. Um, sometimes we have people do cooking classes. Kathy Hester lives not far from us uh, in Durham mm-hmm. and she's a cookbook author. So she'll do, she's done a couple of, of different classes. So I think you just have to find out what people are interested in. We had a woman come and do some, I can't remember what it was, but it was like a, yo- it's a yoga type session, meditation. And that was kind of fun, but you would be amazed. You start learning what people's um, passions and expertise you know, like your husband's a physician and Mm -hmm. you have people come in and they can share their knowledge with people. We've had physicians come in and speak to the group. So when you can have a physician address the group, that's powerful because not all of us have a personal physician that can speak to us about nutrition. So when we can do it in a setting, like in, at a, um, like a speaking event or something like that, that's, that's really effective. So now I noticed that you have, um, a Plant Pier is launching a new culinary program. Can you tell us about that? Um, so after the film, well, the culinary program is kind of, I, I sort of touched on this before, our dry line, our sauces, and okay. we're going to pair that with the film. So when the film comes out, we'll also have the food coming out so people can make their own meal plan. Um, so I've been working since this cookbook was finished, I've been working on getting recipes ready for that so that people can put themselves on a meal plan. They can, you know, buy the food and create, build the recipes from there. So that's, that's going to kind of go together. Let's hope it happens at the same time. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) You know, basically meal plan, like we did in the immersion using these meal packs, because a lot of the recipes that we use in the immersion utilize these flavors and these packs and recipes that came from the cookbook. So Yes. And by the way, since you touched on the immersion again, I was excited to learn um, that Dr. Lori Marvis was the doctor that was um, Mm -hmm. involved in this immersion program. I know who she is. She has a podcast and I'm a huge fan of her work. She was she was wonderful and um, she was great with the participants, very knowledgeable. She spent a lot of time educating them about, you know, their diabetes and how it relates to food. Um, I learned, I learned a few things with those, with the continuous glucose monitors. That was very interesting. We could watch how people, how the food was, you know, changing quickly. I mean, you could, you could watch what things were making the blood sugar go up, what things were, you know, not, that was fascinating. The people, as they were eating plant-based, they loved the food. They absolutely loved all the food that we served them. And one of the participants said, I haven't eaten this much food in my entire life. And he was loving it. We didn't give them snacks or desserts because every four hours there was a meal and they were really enjoying it. And that particular person now has gone home. He and his wife are both plant-based and he sent me pictures of his food. He's trying to get his friends to do this. He's a wonderful cook. Um, but he had amazing results. So I, I, I just have to give a shout out to um, the food is medicine. It's not just salad and potatoes. It's so much more. It's it, The food was just really, really good. And thank I thank Fernando Peralta for helping us with that. So probably our pod leaders will get a sneak peek to it. I know our pod is going to get a sneak peek. It's done. <laughs> it's done now. So, yeah. Kim, you're so involved in so many things. You have this cookbook that will be released soon. Um, but I'm still going to ask anyway, Do you? what are some of your future goals or anything else that's coming up in 2023? You've already sort of talked about the culinary program with the sauces and the film, but anything else that you would like my listeners um, to know about you? 
Yeah, my plan is to start doing more cooking videos live. So hopefully if they're not live, they'll be, we'll get them out to people one way or the other through YouTube. So I'd like to get back into that because I think people really need that support and the resources. But my passion is these immersions. I just love the immersions. I love the people. I love the results. I just, so I told Nelson, I, I want to do that the rest of my life. I, I just want to do immersions till the cows come home. So that's one thing we've been talking about doing them in our local community and bringing people in. We've been talking to some facilities here who could help with the food and, um, finding a physician who will help us. So that's, that's what my passion is. I'd like to sort of retire and cruise into that role. <laughs> yes. Because that's when you know uh, that you're creating real change with yes. these immersions. We had the support that we had in our group. I mean, even right down to the film people, it was a, it was a small group. I think I was cooking for a total of 15, 20 people, something like that. But it, it was just so nice to all be together and living the lifestyle and talking about it. So mm -hmm. that's something I think if people really are get serious about wanting to get healthy and really wanting to change, I think going to an in-person immersion mm -hmm. and being handheld, hand-holding a little bit. I think that's yeah. very effective. It really is. Yeah. So are there any websites or social media that you'd like to share? And I will add them to the show notes as well. Um, of course, it's plantpurenation.com. That's, that's where you can go and get recipes and information about Plant Pure. And then there's plantpurecommunities.org. That's our nonprofit arm that, that houses basically all of our uh, pod leaders and our pods. So if you want to start a pod or you want to find out if there's a pod in your community, you can go to plantpurecommunities.org and go there. Um, as far as social media, we have a Plant Pure Nation Facebook page. We have a Plant Pure Nation Instagram page. I'm Plant Pure Chef, so I have a separate um, account, but I'm actually managing all of that above. So you can reach me through Plant Pure Chef, Facebook, Plant Pure page, Instagram. And, and you can also reach me through Plant Pure Nation. So we're kind of a small organization. So my daughters used to do the Plant Pure Nation social media, and then they got jobs and left. <laughs> so now I do it. <laughs> if individuals want to support your work, um, say through donations, what is the best way to do that? You can go to plantpurecommunities.org, and I believe there's a, a an area on that website for donations as well. So thank you for mentioning that. A lot um, on a tight budget for both Plant Pure Nation, but Plant Pure Communities, we have a lot of volunteers and community and pod leaders, and we've had so many people who are passionate who have helped us to kind of keep this engine going. And so thank you to people like you, Maya, and mm. you know people, other pod leaders across the country. So we run on a tight budget. <laughs> yeah, well, we believe in the work that you're doing. And uh, we're all excited to to see what 2023 will bring. I just have this feeling that new leaders will rise and pods will grow. Because and you know, that's that support that people need will take place. And even if you don't have a pod near you, you can either start a pod, or just gather all these resources from Plant Pure Nation and plantpurecommunities.org because there's, I mean, that's the first thing I did when I became a pod leader is I went through all the resources and created a folder. And that's mm -hmm. kind of like how I got started. I learned what movies I should watch, what books I should read, how to run a, a potluck. I mean, you just learn so much that there's so much work that's already been done ahead of time to support one another. And our goal is to help improve the health of our community, really. And the community can be local, but it also can be virtual. So I have a question for you, Maya, because I think this is a really interesting concept is you created a podcast. This podcast is part of your pod program. Can you share a little bit about that? I, I know you did earlier, but just once again, because I, I want to share this at our pod meeting tomorrow, because it's such a great mm -hmm. way to get this information out there. Yeah. Well, thank you for asking. I started my podcast in the fall of 2018. And I want to say that same year is when I became a pod leader. What I initially wanted to do was highlight the people that are creating change in my community in Dallas. So mm -hmm. some some of those earlier interviews are with people in here that either had like a prep kitchen uh, uh, or doing 
prepping meals uh, to support community as a business or uh, people that are doing that were doing like food demos or athletes or whatever, you name it. If I knew about them, I showcased them on my podcast early on. So it was really local. We made it about health because mm -hmm. my husband is my co co-leader. And so we took the opportunity to talk about all those um, chronic diseases that afflict many of his patients. Right. Um, and that's the other reason why I started the podcast too, because some of the patients could not, they're very advanced with their disease, so they could not attend our in-person gatherings. So it seemed easy to just tune in to listen to the mm -hmm. conversations uh, that I would have. And then the pandemic happened, we stopped meeting and I had this inner sense of desperation, Kim, of, oh my God, there were people that were about to make the change or who needed the support and now we stopped. I didn't know what to do. So that's where my reach expanded and I just started bringing in more people, but no longer local but from around the world, mainly the states, um, who were experts and, and highlighting them in the field of nutrition. And I'm, uh, and I'm hearing of more people in the plant-based world that are starting podcasts. So, yeah, I think it's a, it's a great idea. I, I, especially if I know if our pod leader had a podcast, um, I would be listening. Um, and I think a lot of people mm -hmm. um, in our community and our pod community would listen too. So that's wonderful. I, I love what you're doing. You're saving lives. That's great. That's great. It, it, because of you, because of you and Plan Pure, uh, all that you guys have done. And if you ever have any questions about um, podcasting, feel free to reach out. But I will tell you that it's a wonderful thing to have those testimonials. So the lives that you're impacting to hear them to come on the show, that's what's moving. That is what, why... Uh, documentaries are so effective. That's why the film is so powerful because it just, That's right. it, it, it does, it highlights the stories. So as we're wrapping up, is there anything else that you'd like to share with my listeners, a final message? I think my message to people out there who are thinking about going plant-based or who've just started going plant-based is be um, forgiving with yourself. It's a journey and some people do it overnight and they do it beautifully. And other people, it takes a little bit longer. Be patient with yourself. You can always correct with the next meal. <laughs> you know, you mess up for breakfast and, you know, lunch is four hours around the corner. So just, you know, don't, don't, don't be too hard on yourself and surround yourself with people who believe in this, who have experienced it. And um, just just give it a try because it's really uh, it's not hard. It's not hard. And, and in the world we live in today, there are so many resources out there and so much, many different food options that you can look into. But, yeah, just be forgiving and um, surround yourself with, with like minded people, I think. That's a beautiful message. Thank you, Kim, for being on the podcast today. Yeah, this was wonderful. You've been listening to the Healthy Lifestyle Solutions podcast with your host, Maya Acosta. If you've enjoyed this podcast, do us a favor and share with one friend who can benefit from this episode. Feel free to leave an honest review as well at ratethispodcast.com forward slash HLS. This helps us to spread our message. And as always, thank you for being a listener.